Like, this is the easier, softer way. It is. I was like, fuck that. I ain't doing that shit, man. I'm not writing stuff down. I'm not doing a meditation. I'm not praying. Uh, I heard the word God and I equated religion to it, so I ain't doing that. And, uh, and, and man, I could have saved myself years and years of pain and suffering. But again, had I not done what I did, I wouldn't be where I am today. That was One Rep Marv, and this is The Share Podcast. It's time for the Share Recovery Podcast, where we bring you amazing life-changing success stories from addicts and alcoholics all over the world who share their inspiring journey in recovery. And now, here's your host, O. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Share Podcast. And today we have One Rep Marv joining us on the show. And Marv is the founder of One Rep at a Time, Fitness Through a Recovery Mindset, a website that blends fitness information with the challenges faced by those in recovery from some sort of addiction. He has a bachelor's degree of science in kinesiology with an emphasis in exercise science earned in 2010, and yes, he is an addict. So please join us as Marv takes us through his battle with drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in his life, and his journey into recovery up until today. But first, a reading from Just for Today. January 24th, from isolation to connection. Our disease isolated us. Hostile, resentful, self-centered, and self-seeking, we cut ourselves off from the outside world. Addiction is an isolating disease, closing us off from society, family, and self. We hid. We lied. We scorned the lives we saw others living, surely beyond our grasp. Worst of all, we told ourselves there was nothing wrong with us, even though we knew we were desperately ill. Our connection with the world and with reality itself was severed. Our lives lost meaning and we withdrew further and further from reality. The program is designed especially for people like us. It helps reconnect us to the life we were meant to live, drawing us out of our isolation. We stop lying to ourselves about our condition. We admit our powerlessness and the unmanageability of our lives. We develop faith that our lives can improve, that recovery is possible, and that happiness is not permanently beyond our grasp. We get honest. We stop hiding. We show up and tell the truth, no matter what. And as we do, we establish the ties that connect our individual lives to the larger life around us. We addicts need not live lives of isolation. The 12 steps can restore our connection to life and living if we work them. Just for today, I am part of the life around me. I will practice my program to strengthen my connection to my world. My name is Omar. I'm an addict. Wow, what a powerful reading. This is one of those like super intense readings. Like when you hear someone read this at a meeting, you're like, whoa, that's what the fuck being an addict is all about. Hostile, resentful, self-centered, self-seeking, cut off from the outside world. That's who we were. That's what the disease does. Make no mistake about it. This is not a joke. It will fucking kill you. It will isolate you and it will kill you. And this is the best part, at least for me, speaking as an individual without promoting Narcotics Anonymous, that Narcotics Anonymous saved my life. I mean, there is no question about it. I had no idea what I was up against. If you're new to this and you're listening and you're just now kind of testing the waters out of, I don't know if I should go to meetings and I don't know if I'm an addict. If you're listening to this podcast, if you found this podcast, chances are you are an addict. If you are not being proactive and taking measures to battle the disease of addiction, then this is going to happen to you. The 12 Steps of Narcotics Anonymous gave me a life beyond my wildest dreams, period. And it's not something that happens overnight. We all come in apprehensive and afraid because we don't know what this is all about. But make no mistake about it. Alone, we will die. Today, my life is filled with love. It's filled with happiness. I have friends. I have a relationship with a higher power that I call God. I have an amazing marriage. I have a wonderful relationship with my daughter, with my mother, with my sister, with my family. Today, I am someone that people refer to that people recommend, that people rely on. And 13 years ago, I was a cancer to everyone and everything I came in contact with. And that's exactly what the disease wanted. It wanted me to be a cancer so that I could be rooted out and crushed. But first, 
destroy everything in my path, including my relationships. So if you're new to this program, then give yourself a break. Give yourself a chance. If you are afraid to go to meetings, if you are afraid to reach out and ask for help, if you are afraid to be exposed, then you are living in isolation. You are disconnected from society. You are disconnected from your higher power, and you are disconnected from reality, which is exactly where the disease wants you to be. So do yourself a favor. Reach out. Ask for help. I promise you, you will have a life beyond your wildest dreams. It's the same promise that was given to me, the promise of freedom from active addiction, which is exactly how my life is today. A grateful recovering addict. Thanks for letting me share. So now let's dive into Marv's story. But first, if you have not yet rated and reviewed the Share Podcast, please, one of the best ways to help support the show is to go to iTunes, leave us a five-star rating and a review, and that helps catapult us up the ratings on iTunes, which will make it easier for more and more people to find the Share Podcast. Now, in the past, many of you have asked, hey, oh, how can I help support the show? Well, I'm going to keep it simple for you. First, I want to thank the people who have sent us donations via PayPal. There are a few of you that still continuously send donations on a monthly basis, but we can always use more. So on a weekly basis, I have over 5,000 listeners every week who listen to the Share Podcast. So if 100 of you guys would send me five bucks a month, that would completely support the show from beginning to end. So for those of you who have the wherewithal to send me five bucks, either PayPal or by Patreon, then please feel free to do so. We could really use the support. Also, when you're purchasing stuff on Amazon, there are those of you that are still clicking on the Amazon link on the Share Podcast website before doing their purchases on Amazon. But again, there are thousands of you listening. If each and every one of you could just remember to go to the Share website, click on the Amazon button before you do your shopping, that is also going to make a tremendous difference for us financially. So I haven't been one to emphasize it in the past, right? But now we've got a solid listener base. I know you guys love the show. I know you guys get a lot out of it. There are those of you just like in the meetings that are newcomers, the money's tight. Keep listening. The show will always be for free. The Share Podcast Private Accountability Group will always be for free. But for those of you who can, kick in a couple of bucks. Help us out here. And not to forget the Share Podcast private accountability group. Again, it's growing like crazy. Guys, go to the Share Podcast, www.thesharepodcast. Click on the button that says join the Facebook private group. For those of you that are in the private accountability group, you know how vital and important that has become. There's over 1,500 members in there. If you don't want to go to meetings, if you have problems connecting with people, if you need something more than just the podcasts and are not ready to cross over into meetings or some other structured program, then the private accountability group is perfect for you. Jump in there, make comments, ask questions, or just read the posts. There are so many people out there that have the same questions that you have. All you have to do is just read those and then read all the follow-up answers and responses that come. And make sure to subscribe to my weekly newsletter so you know every single time a brand new episode is launched. And of course, if you have any questions, just email me, o at the sharepodcast.com, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. So now a quick message from our sponsors, and then on to the show. Sober Nation is the largest online recovery community and treatment resource center. They provide treatment resources to those struggling with addiction, as well as to the family members who are caught in the crossfire. On top of that, Sober Nation is a huge community of good people who share their experience with each other. They have informative content, recovery and addiction news, as well as an entire clothing line which helps expand the culture of recovery. They can easily be found at www.SoberNation.com. Sober Nation is putting recovery on the map. Hey, Marv, thanks for joining us. Hey, yo, thanks for having me. Great to have you on the show today, buddy. How you feeling? Well, other than getting over being sick and extremely sleep deprived, I am fantastic, terrific, wonderful, all of the above about yourself. I am feeling right about the same, brother. I love it. So nice. we're already starting on the same page. 
So folks, today we have Marv joining us, the founder of One Rep at a Time. His website blends fitness information with the challenges faced by those in recovery from some sort of addiction. After years of non-biased research, soul-searching, and step work, Marv has been able to completely change his approach not only to fitness, but to nutrition, body image, and overall sense of well-being and spirituality. For years, he has only wanted to help people. Today, he has finally found his calling to give back what was so freely given to him in recovery. Sound about right, Marv? Spot on. All right. Excellent. So let's dive right in. So first of all, Marv, tell us a little bit about what your normal daily routine looks like, including recovery. Um, yeah, of course. So. so I wake up, I start brewing coffee. Uh, while I'm brewing coffee, I read my daily reflection book of choice. I say my own version of a third step prayer. Then I do some morning cardio because I'm a fitness guy. So I got to get that cardio in first thing in the morning or I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> so I do that. Uh, I finish up with that, write my to-do list for today and start working, whether it be writing, whether it be training clients, um, working for other websites or whatever. And then um, at some point, I talk to somebody in recovery. Um, I make meetings three, four days a week, which I recognize is nowhere near enough, but that's just being honest. No judgment here, buddy. Right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my sponsor is going to get on me when he hears that, Uh oh. but, uh, right. But other than that, yeah, if I don't do my routine in the morning, I just feel off all day. I'm agitated. I don't feel motivated. I get, you know, kind of like a dog chasing a car type situation where I'm just kind of scatterbrained and jumping from thing to thing. So if I don't do those, you know, those things of recovery first, drink my coffee, do my cardio, meditate, start kicking ass right away. Like I just, I'm a procrastinator and I'm a, I'm a procrastinating perfectionist. So like one day I'm going to be fantastic, just not today. And um, that'll come up real quick if I don't do my routine. That makes sense. That, that totally makes sense. And it's very important, especially for those of us in early recovery, to try and establish that morning routine to, to kind of get your, you know, your juices flowing, first of all, and then actually getting the mindset, you know, for the day ready to go, you know, so you're incongruent with your higher power, which is my next question. How do you maintain regular? You said meditating. Is there something more you do to maintain your spiritual condition on a daily basis? Um... Well, I suck at meditating, but I'm really trying. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's just more if if I isolate and I don't talk to other people in recovery and I don't go to meetings and I you know don't put that magnifying glass away, then my spiritual condition just gets totally messed up. You know, um, my first symptom is I get really irritated really easily. I don't let shit just fall off my shoulders. You know, that whole rule if it doesn't apply, let it fly. I can't follow that at all. Everything bugs me. Um, I just become irritable, tired, and discontent, and that's my first warning sign that my spiritual condition is lacking. For so many of us, that irritable, restless, discontent feeling, it happens. The ego kind of takes over. Yeah. If for whatever reason you haven't found a way to ground yourself, then at any given moment you can just spiral out of control. So I think it's important that at any given moment in the day you can just take a break real quick and connect with your higher power. Quick third-step prayer or a quick... Serenity prayer sometimes does the trick. Oh, without a doubt. Like one of my favorite sayings to say, and I hate people who say slogans and crap, but uh, <laughs> I don't have bad days. I just have bad moments. And if I have enough bad moments to equal 24 hours, I'm just trying to feel sorry for myself and I got to knock that off. Yep, absolutely. Could not agree more. All right. So first of all, tell us how much clean time you have and what is your anniversary date? I just celebrated three and a half years while on vacation last week. Uh, June 22nd, 2013 is my clean and sobriety date. Beautiful. Awesome. I love it. And now tell us how old you were the first time you drank or used drugs. And more importantly, how did they make you feel? Um, that's an interesting answer for me because uh, I had tried booze at like 16. I tried wild turkey in a movie theater and I thought it was gasoline and I thought it was just horrendous and why the hell did people do this? I drank it out of a water bottle that a friend had brought and it was just like, I don't get that. Then I tried to smoke marijuana that year and <laughs> I didn't know how to smoke correctly so I didn't get high and I got made fun of a lot, <laughs> which is an awesome story but that's for another time. Right. Um, but, but then uh, the first time I got loaded was 17. I had had a major injury. So I still had arm casts on, I had a head injury and I was really depressed and I was just determined to get 
loaded. I was, you know what? I'm depressed. I'm miserable. I'm in pain. F this. I'm going to do what I want. I got drunk on uh, 151 rum and Smirnoff ice. So my first three boozes were wild turkey, 151 and Smirnoff ice. Why I kept drinking, uh, probably a warning flag that I was going to develop alcoholism. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) like, I didn't like, I didn't think like, oh, this is gonna be a problem. It was more of this solves everything. Yeah, absolutely. Smarter, sexier, stronger, could talk to women, more confident, um, didn't need validation from others. Like I, once I got like truly drunk that first time, like I was off and running, like that's what I was going to chase no matter what it cost me to do, no matter what the wreckage was going to be. I don't care. I found my answer for everything. Beautiful. Okay. Well, which leads us to the next segment of the show, which is your story. (laughs) It's time for me to turn this show over to you, Marv. It's time for you to share your story, the battle against drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in your life, when you hit rock bottom, and finally your journey into recovery up until today. So Marv, take it away, buddy. All right. Thanks. So, all right. So I'm 30 years old. And like I just said, I just have three and a half years of recovery. Um, I was, this is not my first go around. I'm a chronic relapser. More on that later. Um, I know today that drugs and alcohol are a symptom or nothing but a symptom of something far deeper. Um, so my whole life I had alcoholic or addict, like thinking thought processes, emotions, insecurities. Um, I don't feel like I came out of the womb, a self-loathing narcissist or a, you know, an egomaniac with inferiority complex who hated himself, who, who self-sabotaged all that crap. But I learned those behaviors at such a young age, like it became my normal state of being. So even as a kid, I was uncomfortable in my own skin, hated myself, had no sense of identity, which became the single greatest problem in my life. Um, And because of that, I needed validation from others. Because I didn't have a true identity, I didn't feel good about myself, I needed to get validation from others. And so my identity changed over the years. Um, whether it be something or worse, someone would, I, I would be my identity. So as a kid, um, I was raised in a very well to do, extremely religious family, two loving parents and a younger sister, um, hardcore religious. Um, and so when I was young, my identity was the church and religion. So I was like the altar boy, the choir boy, the kid who sang solos in the church and all that. Like, uh, I love them to death, but I was introduced as a kid, as this is our grandson, you know, Marv, and he's going to be a pastor someday. And oh, like, man, oh. right. Like that's a loaded statement. And I embraced that because like, I got that, that like twinkle in their eyes, like the, they were proud of me. And because I hated myself, that's what I, I latched onto. So that was my identity till eighth grade. I graduated best Christian attitude. I said, I wanted to be a pastor and, and I just, I just ate all that up. And, um, and when I got to, then I went to public high school and like my eyes are kind of open. So I went from a school of 200 kids to 2000 kids. Um, so again, I'm already uncomfortable in my own skin. Um, God bless my parents. I love them. They're extremely strict. Like couldn't see PG 13 movies. So I was 13. Um, yeah. Yeah. I remember that. All that. Yeah. Uh, grounded for saying the word more. And so I always felt different than my peers. Cause they were like, you're going to laugh. They're like Titanic was big when I was a kid, right? And I couldn't see it because apparently there was some like titty that was gonna come out of the movie screen and kill me, you know. So I couldn't <laughs> see it, right? And like they talk about it at school, and I'd be like, I don't know what that's like. And I couldn't hang out with my peers, so I felt different. So I was already feeling different through the eighth grade at that small school, and I go to public high school where I know like four people out of two thousand, and I just, you know, I'm introverted. Uh, when I don't know anybody, then once I feel comfortable, I'm extremely extroverted. So it was like a weird situation. Um, and in high school, I try, I jumped from crowd to crowd trying to find my place. Um, could never really fit in. You know, I, I played basketball, but I never got off the bench. I tried to hang out with the jocks, but I'm unathletic. I'm small. I haven't grown into my body yet. Um, tried to hang out with the burnouts later on and, and just whatever. And I just never felt comfortable. Like I could never find my thing. Um, let me say that by the time I was 22, I have had, uh, what is it, eight or nine major operations, a head injury, multiple broken bones. I've been in the ICU. So um, I learned to play the victim at a very young age. Um, my first major operation was in sixth grade, and I learned to play the victim at a very young age. And, and when I played the victim, I got pity from others, and more importantly, I felt pity for myself. Um, and... Today I know that I played the victim because when I feel pity for myself, I then feel entitled to do whatever the hell I have to do to make myself feel better. So right. I learned to play the victim at a young age, 
And I had a major injury at 17. Um, that changed my life forever. Um, it's on video. I've watched it once. Jackass was really big at that time. <laughs> and uh, it's at my 70th birthday, my 70th birthday party. We're waiting for my dad to pick me and my friends up to go to Dave and Buster's. And we're bombing the hills on a skateboard and scooters and all that. And uh, apparently I bomb a hill. It's not even a Razor scooter, dude. It was a Hot Wheels brand scooter. And I'm trying to jump wooden pallets, and I pull up too late, and I clip the front, and I go flying and snap my wrist, break my back, torn rotator cuff, crack my collarbone, and have a, a pretty serious head injury where I'm in ICU for the next couple of days. And um, I woke up out of that, and I didn't know my middle name. I had to do a lot of speech therapy. Um, I went from a straight A AP, AP student overnight to could barely keep up in college prep and was talking about going to remedial, so I was extremely depressed. Um, and that's when I started getting loaded. So then that became my new identity. Absolutely. Um, Cause like I said, it fixed everything, right? I was still insecure. Um, I had always, my first escape from reality, looking back, even as a kid was just daydreaming and fantasizing. And I know kids daydream and fantasize, but I'm talking like excessive. Like I would have two, two types of fantasies, right? And the first one's going to sound okay. And the second one, people are going to be like, this guy is off of his rocker. And it's true. Um, my first fantasy would be I want to be big, buff, um, ride a motorcycle, good at sports, get all the chicks, be popular, everything I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Surprising. None of us, none, not, none of us ever felt like that like you did. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Who didn't want to be that? <laughs> exactly. You know? So, like, that was like the normal daydreaming, fantasizing. And I was like, you know, when I'm 16, I'm going to be this. When I'm 17, I'm going to be this. When I'm 18, I'm going to be this. You know? And that's normal. But here comes like the whole self-pity playing the victim thing that's kind of screwy. Um, my other fantasy, <laughs> oh my goodness, they're going to put me in the loony bin when I say this. Um, Bring it. Right? I wanted to be the star quarterback in high school, which was a fantasy by itself because like I said, I was extremely unathletic, all that. But I wanted to be the star quarterback in high school and on, on homecoming night, I wanted to score, throw the game-winning touchdown as time expired. Then I wanted to be crushed by the defensive lineman, be paralyzed, and then have them have to cart me off the field while the crowd is chanting Marv, 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 and the girls are crying, and that would be perfect. I wanted to be paralyzed at 18, but I wanted to be the, the hero. And if like if I could live to be paralyzed at 18, oh my God, my life would be perfect. Like I truly, truly wanted that. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Right? That's not that's not that's not like normal daydreaming, you know. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. So like that's just crazy. Oh, well, I shouldn't say crazy, but that's just not your normal thought process, right? So like I said, I had that alcoholic victim addict mentality. Um and so once that injury happened, uh, like I said, I got drunk for the first time, then I started getting high, and then within a year, um, I'm, I've graduated cocaine and, and more painkillers and uh, all that stuff. And uh, that became my new identity because immediately my friends and I realized I could take way more substances than they could. And when they would be okay with two or three, I needed five or six and then I still wanted more. You know, from a young age, it was Marv, you like smoke differently than us or you drink differently than us or you do whatever differently than us. And like, I thought that was cool, right? Like my new identity became, let's see how many substances I could do and show up to high school football. And, and that was my new identity. And, um, it's just, you know, which is anti everything I was raised. So I was rebelling, which right. I recognize, you know, um, my ego was, well, <laughs> you said, I can't do this. Well, watch me, you know, um, and uh, it was just madness. And uh, I still graduated high school. I still did pretty good with grades, you know, because I, like I said, I had been that straight A student because, like, you were expected to get straight A's in my household. Um, you're expected to go to college and all that, which, you know, was is a fantastic atmosphere. So I worked my ass off. Um, and then the in injury happened. I got really depressed and I had the mental issues from the head injury. And then you add, my brain is, you know, reeling from an injury and instead of letting it heal, I'm going to start adding substances on a daily basis. So not a good combination. Right. You know, so I graduated high school and uh, I got busted for, I got busted for something. I, I, you know, my mom would tell me that she would pray for me to get caught. I'd be like, why the hell are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Knock it off. Stop it. You know, so I got caught doing something. So my parents, you know, God bless them. Um, oh, you're not allowed to go away to college. You want to go to a local college. So I went to a local state school and it was like the top 10 party school in the nation at the time. So that's a great environment for a budding alcoholic drug addict. Yes. 
Uh, I lasted one year before they asked me to take my services elsewhere, which is a fancy way of saying I flunked out. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. uh, Right? And uh, so I told my parents, and they drug test me on one of those at-home kits, and I fail for everything possible on the kit. And they sent me to my first outpatient program, and that's 19 years old. So that's when I was introduced to the concept of recovery. Um, I thought it was kind of nonsense, but I had, I recognized that I was getting in over my head with the wrong sorts of people and the wrong sorts of substances. You know, I did that stereotypical disappear for three months, and I come back three months later, I'm 30 pounds lighter, and I'm having bloody noses all the time, and you know, the shifty eyes and the clammy skin, and we all know what causes that. Oh, yeah. And um, so they sent me there, and um, I always remember I'd be like, I have like 23 days uh, clean from drugs, but I drank last night, so I have 23 days. And they'd be like, Marv, that's not how it works. And I'm like, well, that's how, <laughs> that's how it works for me. Like, that's what I'm willing to do. Right. So uh, um, thank God, though, I got off the hard, the quote unquote hard drugs, which, I mean, whatever. I hate that, that, that term, but we kind of know what that means. You know, I got off the quote unquote hard street drugs. Um, and that was good enough for me. I occasionally drank, um, I actually quit smoking, uh, marijuana and I was like that dry drunk static addicts. I went to one meeting. Um, this is not the hate, but I went to uh, my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and an addict identified himself as an addict and it was a closed meeting. So they kicked him out. And that was my excuse to never go back. Yeah, absolutely. You know, which, You got, you know, the traditions say that's the right thing to do. So I will just leave it at that. But that was my excuse. I said, are you kidding me? These people are kicking people out of their meetings. That's madness. Because I was just looking for the differences. I wasn't looking for the similarities. Um, I just, I still wanted attention where I would brag about how much I would use and how I would have this, you know, this reputation and this mystique and this ego and all that crap. But again, I still hate myself. So it's just false pride encapsulating self-loathing and it's just misery and um but it got me to like it it kept me alive because what i was doing and who i was hanging with and what we were doing i would have landed behind bars or dead really fast i was putting myself in terrible situations we all do that you know doing things we're not proud of or not exactly legal and all that crap so that was me in 19 um and my new identity then became a relationship because again still no identity that ended and I went to shit. Um, so after that, my new identity became, what did I do next? I got into triathlons and stuff like that. So that was my new thing. Like I'm a triathlete, you know, this is what I do. And, but it was more of a way to like get back at her when she dumped me. It was my first major relationship. And, um, and it was this, ugh. um, I lost happiness for like a year, you know, cause, cause my, my, uh, my MO with women is, uh, either, as a kid and teenager and whatever, I'd fall head over heels in love and get dumped and have my little heart broken, or I would just be the stereotypical jerk, douchebag, jerk off, one night stand. Well, not one night stand, but just player, all that crap. So that's my two things. So um, she broke up with me, and I just went to shit, like I said, and uh, I did triathlons. But with all my previous injuries, you know, my knees can't. I couldn't walk upstairs without being in agony. My knees are hurting because I've had so many surgeries. So I had to give that up. And that's when I was introduced to lifting weights in the gym. Um, and uh, the funny thing with that, because now that's what I do for a living, right? So obviously it, it took off. But right. when I was first introduced to the gym, I would only go if I was drunk or high on cocaine. How friends. do you Wait a minute. How do you work out of the gym high on cocaine? Very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Your heart is racing. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm lucky I didn't have a, a heart attack. Yeah, so, like uh, I was, I was writing for a buddy of mine for his site, and it was like he's like, "Can you explain that to me?" I was like, "Sure." Like, looking back at it now, I was just so insecure if I was drunk or high on cocaine. Like the voices of "You don't know how to do every exercise from day one. How dare you?" <laughs> or "Look how scrawny you are compared to that guy in the mirror." Or "You're not as strong as your friends." Like that voice would be quieted. So I'd only go if I was loaded. And, uh, but something clicked, right? Cause when I remember, when I remember I said when I was a kid, I wanted to be big and buff and ride a motorcycle and something clicked. And, and about six months of doing that, which thank God I didn't have a freaking heart attack. Um, I decided I wanted to pursue that more. So I quit getting loaded and I started working out, but I don't know anything, you know, I'm reading those muscle comics, AKA muscle mags and, 
And before long, I decided I wanted to have a, you know, a male fitness model body and do whatever it took. So within, with less than two years of working out in the gym, I decided I would hop on steroids, um, which is a really smart thing to do. Yeah. So, tw- yeah. So 21 and a half, I hop on gear. Don't know what the hell I'm doing. I didn't do any research. My friend's mom had to teach me how to inject and got needles from her work. And it's just madness. Your and, friend's um, mom actually helped you inject steroids. Yeah. Good times. <laughs> Which is another like warning flag. Like this is not normal. But I was like, cool. Awesome. And I don't have to buy the needles. That's sweet. You know? <laughs> And so, like, I remember, like, the dealer was like, this is what you're going to do. I was like, all right. And he's like, do you drink? I was like, occasionally. He's like, do you smoke? I was like, no. He's like, well, you smoke now because you can't drink on it. And I was like, oh, is there anything else I need to be doing? And he just kind of looked at me, and he's like, all right, man, this is all I'm going to give you. I'm not going to give you any more. I'm not going to let you do anything else. And and I went behind that guy's back and got more types of gear after because I was, like, obsessed with it. That's kind of another story. I apologize. I'm getting off on a tangent. So, uh, <laughs> but that, but that's all part of the deal. You know what I mean? Like that's right? all part of the, the sneakiness of being an addict. Yes. Yes. Like this guy who was a stranger, who was my steroid dealer slash guru. I was going behind his back. Yeah. I didn't want it to be him. Like this isn't enough. I need more. I'm obsessed. So, so obviously if you hop on gear when you're 21 years old and you haven't been working out for two years and you know what the hell you're doing and you're, you believe that you only need to eat boiled chicken, rice, and veggies seven times a day like the professionals do. And, you know, three-hour workout sessions in the gym, well, I got pretty muscular pretty quickly. And and I'd always said I'm only going to do one one cycle. You know, that's all I'm going to do. And, you know, because I was occasionally drinking and I was occasionally smoking and, and I knew I shouldn't be drinking and drugging and doing that as well. And uh, – but I was obsessed, right? Cause, cause I got that female attention. I got the sense of validation from other guys like, look how big you are, look how muscular you are, how strong you are. And I was hooked. So, um, that became my new identity was the gym and my muscles. Um, and during this time, um, I ran away from Southern California to Northern California for college. I was running away from that relationship. I was running away from my past thinking if I, if I just get out of San Diego, um, everything's going to be okay, you know? And, uh, so I did that. And, um, was that I got stable enough to, to justify my drinking and occasionally my occasional drinking and drugging, uh, that I needed to get good grades again. Cause if I got good grades. My parents would be off my back. They're not going to drug test me. You know, I could tell them, look, I'm getting straight A's again. Like I'm, I'm good. So, uh, I got good grades enough to get back to a four university. So I went to a college called Sonoma state. It's an hour North of San Francisco. And, um, and I go there as a kinesiology major. So I'm studying exercise science. My goal is to be a, a physical therapist because I had found a really good job working in a physical therapy department down here. And, and I found my calling, right? Like, this is it. I'm good. But as we know, um, what do they call them? A geographic change? Yep, the geographical that, change. That shit don't work. Never. It's, it's going to catch up to you. And I didn't do any work on myself. And, and, I'm, and I have this secret about I'm doing steroids and, and all this crap. And, uh, and you know, by the time my first semester's up, I am back to smoking weed every day. I'm back to blackout drinking constantly. And I started adding different quote unquote study aids to the mix and whatever else you want to add. And I'm a train wreck. You know, this is the best way to sum it up. I don't, nobody knows I'm a train wreck. But I am barely holding it together, you know. Um, so I joined a fraternity when I'm up there, which is once again great for a budding alcoholic drug addict. Oh, yeah. Um, times. Um, and my whole thing was, look, I work hard to party harder. And so I was that dude in college that everybody hates. Loud, obnoxious, show up to class drunk and high, and then somehow set the curve on every gosh darn test because I would be up for 36 hours straight studying. <laughs> you know, like how do you do that? I'm like, you don't want to know. You know, so lots of blow. <laughs> yeah, like like Adderall for days. Like, oh my god, it was. Oh, crazy. so you were on the Adderall train too? I was on Adderall train. Yeah, because because I so so I had all these rules right in college. I had to get good grades, and I couldn't do the quote unquote hard drugs. So I can't do blow anymore. But okay. Adderall comes from a doctor at some point, so that's okay. It's not my doctor, but it's okay. So I had all these rules in place to justify, to convince myself what I was doing is okay. Correct. Right? Like this is sure, man. It's like with that with that damn fantasy of wanting to be paralyzed. Like 
it was like to a normal person, that's just sheer madness. And to me, it was like, this is freaking awesome. I found like the secret. I could get loaded seven days a week and still get perfect grades. Am I, re- am I going to retain anything? Hell no, but I'll cross that bridge when the time comes. Exactly. And, um, you know, and, uh, substances started picking up, you know, more and more started coming back, but I still had all these rules, but like, I say this, and this isn't the only, like, I don't like to get too vivid because, uh, I don't know, I like to follow the traditions of the fellowships I attend, but I'll just put this into perspective, and this will be the only time I get really in detail about my using. I would have my syringe full of steroids, my bong full of weed, my bottles of painkillers, and my glass of whiskey all out in front of me. I'd put it all in my body, I would ride my bicycle to campus, and then I would study exercise physiology in the lab. All at the same time you would do this? Everything's in my body. Go to class, study exercise phys in the lab, or take a test. You know, if there was a test, I'm on Adderall too. And uh, I'm studying to learn how to repair and heal the human body. And that is how, quote, quote, well, I taught, I treated myself. That is just stellar. Right? But here, I'm too smart for my own good because I'm doing research. Well, if I take this vitamin and this mineral, I'm going to protect my organs. And if I take this, I'm going to release this, you know, this, uh, molecule my brain which will help this drug work better and i do this and i'm just analyzing everything and i'm taking 30 supplements a day uh, i'm doing gear i'm blackout drinking which you never should do on gear i am drugging every single day and i thought i had it made which uh yeah it kind of uh, gives me the willies now but i thought i <laughs> i fucking was king of the world man like did i have just, found it. did you just travel back in time i did <laughs> I was back in my respect <laughs> with all that shit in front of me. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> right? It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So that was me. And I thought I had it. You know, I had the fancy, I had a nice house. I was in the fraternity. I had a really nice car. I was big and buff. Uh, I was doing well with women. I was doing well in school. It was a dream come true. It was. That everybody except wants. For, exactly. On the outside, it was. Except for the little part that I effing hated myself yeah i couldn't look myself in the mirror in the eyes and recognize the man looking back i was massively insecure and i was petrified petrified people would figure out i wasn't as cool as i thought i was or projected to be petrified i'd find out i wasn't i don't whatever you know like i was just afraid that people would figure out that i had been running a scam and i was nothing but a sham and they're gonna figure it out at any moment and my life's gonna be ruined and uh, that's a lot of work to, to maintain all that crap. Absolutely. But uh, I, I did maintain, and uh, I actually graduated with really good grades. And uh, while I was up there, I had another relationship go wrong. And it was up in Northern California. It was when I came back after college. You know, like life was a chore. Every day I was too afraid to live, yet too scared to kill myself. I know the feeling. You know, that incomprehensible demoralization. Just every day I'm like, fuck, I just... I'm not waking up. I'm coming to like, I'm not falling asleep and waking up. I'm passing out and coming to, I come to like, Oh God, I gotta do this again. But I can't let anybody know that I have to project that image of like, everything's good, man. Like this is perfect. And, um, and that's how it was for a long time. And and I graduated college and I came back down to San Diego because my parents, uh, God bless them. Uh, my mom had gotten sick. Uh, she had a, a very serious, I guess you call it a terminal illness. It was a bacterial infection. She got Lyme disease with a bunch of other infections. Oh, man. And uh, she got really, really sick. And they kind of hid it for me when I was up there. One, I didn't come down because that relationship, when it ended, she was in San Diego. So I didn't want to come back. And two, they kind of knew if they told me how bad it was that I would want to drop out of school and come back. Um, But they convinced me to come back and try and help out after I graduated. Because my plan was to move to San Francisco and hang out there and go to grad school up there and do all that. And just keep partying, you know, because I was having a blast. Like, I was still miserable inside, but I was having fun, so it was easy to ignore those feelings of inadequacy, you know. Yes. Um, you know, because, like, look how much fun I'm having. Now, in college, if I didn't black out, I wasn't having a good time. Like, <laughs> my nickname was Messy Marv. <laughs> Great time. So maybe if somebody hears this, they're going to know exactly who the hell is talking right now. <laughs> you know, But like I embraced that. That was my identity. So um, they convinced me to come back and I come home and I see how bad it is. And she it's it's bad, man. Can't eat. So we have to inject her with vitamins and antibiotics through a pick line and an IV. And just just it was just bad. Once I moved back, I had no reason to maintain what I was doing. 
So all bets are off. To sum it up, I went to shit really fast. I moved back in January, and by November of that next year, I lost 90 pounds, and I landed up in the lockdown unit of a psych ward. Oh, man. Yeah, good times. I had been stealing my mom's meds. I had been stealing from other people, and just we'll leave it at that. I was doing despicable things. And um, because, like, I always play the victim, right? So I had these events X, Y, and Z. We don't need to go into detail. But I had multiple events happen all at once. And because I played the victim, like, it was, like, the green light to do whatever the hell you need to do to make yourself feel better. My entitlement went through the roof, and I was just going to do whatever I needed to do. And um, it was bad. We'll just leave it at that. So I lined in the lockdown. It's locked in the psych ward. Um, I volunteered to go there because I it was just bad, man. Like withdrawing and having a panic attack and crawling down my parents' hallway at three in the morning, pounding on the door like I think I'm dying. I don't know what's going on. And you know you don't sleep for I didn't sleep for eleven days or something, getting off all the opiates and and all that crap. And uh, that's and then I went to my first like inpatient rehab, one of those thirty thousand dollar nice spots. And I was like 24, 25. This was 2011. Yeah, you, you were young. Yeah, I was. And like that should have been my bottom, right? Like I almost died. They're like, dude, if you didn't – because I was, I was getting off of like nine or ten different substances cold turkey. Right. You know, sleeping pills, benzos, opiates, spice, alcohol, over-the-counter medications, whatever I could do to numb myself. You know, like I would go to the bottles and be like, I am freaking addicted or I'm, I'm like – I would literally have this image in my head of like, I'm like stuck in a tornado and I'm spiraling down the drain. I'm just reaching out to whatever I can reach out to, to try and numb myself. And, uh, and so that should have been my bottom, right? I was introduced to the rooms. I was introduced to Narcotics Anonymous. I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and I did the sober living thing and I, uh, I do what I'm best at, which is I have a really good mouthpiece on me, so I project this image. Uh, we all have good mouthpieces on us, otherwise we couldn't have done what we did for so long. Yep. You know? But I, I project this image of uh, I'm, re- I'm the recovery guy, right? Like, I hit my bottom. Oh, my God. My life, I've, I'm saved. You know, I'm going to do this. You know? So um, I do that, and, and my new identity becomes recovery, except here's the caveat. I can't moderate anything. Right, moderate Marv has never been meant, muttered once in the history of my life. <laughs> you know, but I try to moderate my recovery. Which okay, makes zero sense. So, I got a quote unquote sponsor that was just a voicemail. I quote unquote work steps, which was like two twenty minute conversations with them before meeting. Um, I didn't work on myself. I wasn't honest, um, and more. I'll talk more about my honesty a little bit later. Um, and I just, I tried to pick and choose what parts of the program I was going to follow. And, uh, I'm a dry drunk. I'm a static addict. I'm not recovering. I'm just abstinent, which for me, abstinence is not enough because I go insane, you know? We all do. uh, Yeah. So what what do you know? Before long, I am secretary meetings dirty. I'm like loaded secretary in a meeting, which is a trip. Dude, the worst. Right, I am taking dirty tokens. I'm working dirty steps, and I beg anybody to listen to this. Um, if you ever have an opportunity to use on your own, and nobody's gonna know, it's gonna be you and your higher power, and it's gonna be great. I beg you not to do it because that is far worse than any relapse. You know what I'm saying? Like it gives that voice of addiction, like you're a piece of you know what, you're a liar, you're a fraud. Look at you again, you know, and uh, been been there, done that, brother. It's right? the absolute worst. Uh, it's one of those where they say, you know, the guy slid in greasier than a gas station mop. <laughs> that is how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, it's the worst. Sitting yeah. in a room, dirty, you know? Ugh. No, 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 no. Do not it- recommend. Right, exactly. And I think I've everybody fooled, but I don't think I had anybody fooled. I think they're just kind of waiting for me to get honest. And uh, so I'd I'd done this for a while because I had started uh, using medication I was given in that rehab center. And and, uh, I realized if I took like six or eight, like I felt those little body tingles again. So I was off and running and um, it was misery. And I did this for like five months or something like that. And I convinced myself, all right. Well, I'm incapable of being honest, so I'm not going to raise my hand in a meeting and tell them I've been lying for five months. I mean, right. don't they know who I think I am. You know, I have all these commitments. People look up to me. So I convince myself if I stage a quote unquote public relapse, it'll help my recovery in the long run. 
which is madness. But I could justify and rationalize anything in my head, which I've my story proves that I could do time and time again, and I'm pretty sure everybody can identify with that. So I stage this public relapse where I get drunk and I go back to the meeting where I secretary and I announce that I'm a newcomer and and uh, I'm badly shaking and, and I have the op and they ask me is so was last night the only time you got loaded and I said yes. They kind of gave me that opening to be like no I've been lying and I, I didn't take it I was too much of a wimp my ego wouldn't let me. Which is always a funny thing when I say my ego wouldn't let me because I hated myself so much so what the hell kind of ego did I have? <laughs> I do. It's that ego that has the, uh, what is it? The, uh, in, oh my God. Well, the inferiority with an egomaniac complex. Yeah. The, yeah. Ego, the egomaniac with an inferiority complex. We yes. are the, we are the giant of our dreams and the dwarfs of our nightmares. Well said. I love that. I love that and being a self-loathing narcissist. Yeah. <laughs> which by definition is impossible, but that totally sums me up. Right. <laughs> so... So I, I don't come clean, and they vote, well, you could, you also want a secretary? And I said, sure. And I go back next week, and I pawn the secretary supplies off on a buddy, and I'm back out and running. And, and it's bad. Um, it's not as bad as it was before I went to the psych ward. So in my mind, I got it made. I'm not doing 10 substances. I'm only doing two or three. And I'm doing massive amounts, but it's, it's nowhere near what it used to be. And um, again, I do despicable things when I'm in my disease. You know, I'm a liar, I'm a cheat, I'm a thief. You know, um, I see that like I'm a liar, you know, because I would tell myself this is my last bottle, my last sack, my last vial, whatever. You know, this is going to be the last one. And I know damn well it's not going to be. I know damn well I'm going to be on my phone in 20 minutes trying to pick up again or go into the store, you know. Um, I'm a cheat when I'm in my disease and left to my own devices because I cheat myself out of a life I can be proud of. I cheat myself out of a relationship with my higher power. Most importantly, I cheat myself out of a relationship with myself. And then worse is I'm a thief because I steal myself away from my friends, family, and loved ones when I'm, when I'm in my disease. So that's what I did one yet, yet again. you know. And uh, I broke all the rules that they tell newcomers and I started dating when I first got clean and sober or, or tried to. Try is the key word. Um, so... I have this wonderful, amazing woman in my life, and she's remaining sober, and I'm using, and she freaking knows it, and uh, it's just not a good match, you know. And uh, some stuff happened, and I get confronted, you know, a little bitty interventions done on me, and I know they're right, so I go back to the rooms, but I get a new sponsor, a real sponsor, the guy who's my sponsor today, and uh, I, I remain more open, but well, yet again, I'm trying to recover. When I use the word try, I'm giving myself permission to fail. And so I was trying to recover, yet I was not going to be honest about my secret relapse. And uh, so that, once again, I'm a static addict, dry drunk, and I get this job where I can make six figures alone, even bonuses alone, and I do really well in the beginning. And, uh, and before long, I get blinded by the money. And uh, that becomes the most important thing in my life. Not my recovery, not meetings, not step work, not hanging out with sober people. Um, the job and moving into a really nice house with a lifelong friend who's a practicing alcoholic, and that seemed smart to me at the time. Oh, boy. Yeah. So as we can see, it's only a matter of time. And uh, uh, my last relapse, God willing, my, my most recent God willing, my last, um, it started with steroids again because uh, I had done some stuff where I kind of messed my body up hormonally, so I felt weak, and I keep comparing myself to what I used to be, and uh, so I start with some gear, and after starting the gear, and I start getting big, I go, well, I need, like, marijuana to, like, mellow myself out. I don't want to get roid rage, even though I've never had roid rage in my entire life, because I think that's a scam, but, like, I convinced myself, well, I need marijuana, and then, well, I'm lifting heavy, so I need the painkillers again, you know, because my body can't take it, and, uh, and so I'm back to my devices of bottle of pills, bong, and syringe. And um, and during this time, once again, I'm crazy. Well, well I'm just I'm not crazy. I just I'm in the depths of my disease. And I and I twice I proved to myself that I could drink like a gentleman. I have a single drink twice. Ignoring the fact that I took a shot of Valium, but I had that single drink and I had only one. So I I have learned to drink like a gentleman. Give me a pat on the back. I've got it. You know, because my, my sponsor is AA-based, so I convinced myself, well, the drugs are none of his concern. It's only the alcohol. And I only had a drink twice. On two separate occasions, I only had one drink, so he doesn't need to know. Right. 
Yeah, because you, you, know, you don't have to be completely honest with your sponsor. Exactly. You know, um, they're more like, you know, like the Pirates of the Caribbean, they're more like guidelines, they're not rules, <laughs> you know? So like, they're more like, okay, I'm going to follow that route. And uh, once again, I'm too afraid to live, scared to die. I see where it's heading. The disease of addiction and alcoholism is progressive, right? Where my disease is progressed. So what took me three, four years to find in that comprehens- incomprehensible demoralization came back in three to four months. The amounts that I was required to take were well more than whatever I used to do in the past. And I know why. I was introduced to the concept of true recovery. I saw what true recovery is this time. And from this point forward, my drinking and using is fucked with a capital F. Because I know deep down in my soul there's a better way to live. So that same amount of substances could not quite give me that relief. So I'd be like, what the hell? I'm taking way more than what I used to. And I'm not getting that relief. I'm not getting that release, that aha moment. And uh, I saw where it was progressing, and I saw what I was going to have to do to get loaded, which would be IV injection, because I, I hadn't gone to that point yet. I'm obviously comfortable with needles with all the gear, but I hadn't done IV yet. And I saw where I was heading, and it scared the, the crap out of me. Right. Because I'm an I'm gonna OD, man. I do 10 substances at one time. I do it till I'm passing out, and, you know, just other stuff is going on. We'll just leave it at that, because I don't want to get too graphic. And, uh, and it was this mayhem, and uh, I got caught. And I lied because, um, you know, <laughs> what's this in your pocket? Oh, it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so these are your jeans. Yeah, it's not mine. Yeah, you know. I kind of remember that too. Right? <laughs> yeah, Dude, that's, on, that's not mine? Come right? on. Oh. Exactly. Officer, I wasn't speeding. I promise. You know? And so I got caught with that. And it took me three days to finally be honest about the, the severity of my relapse. And, um, like, oh, I, I was only doing like four a day. Okay, I was doing like 10 a day. Okay, I was really doing like 20, 25 a day. And I was doing this and I was doing that and all this crap. So it took me a couple days to finally get honest because, again, my ego is getting in the way. And uh, on June 22nd, 2013, I found my God. That was when I found my God, which was the gift of desperation. That's what I the acronym stands for for me. Uh, uh-huh. And I met my sponsor and uh, sponsee brother for coffee. And I told him, like, you know, like I said, I was, it wasn't that bad. I was only doing a little bit. And I got there and, and I did what I didn't have the courage to do in treatment the first time. I got 100% honest. I said, look, I've lied to you. My relapse is way worse than anybody knows. I have a ton of stuff in my house I need you to get rid of. I have bags of syringes and vials and pills and bottles and whatever. And I need help. And, uh, I decided to do something drastic. I quit my job. I put all my stuff in storage, and I entered the hardest program I could find here in um, in the, the I guess you could call it the West Sea Coast of the United States. I went to a short term intense behavior modification program. I volunteered to go, and I and I volunteered to stay for the full four months. So typically they keep you for three months, and I said, "Oh no, I'm staying for four. I'm staying till you kick me out." And uh, because I was, you know, I tried the super rich rehabs, I tried the outpatient, and I needed something gnarly, right? And I needed to do it on my own. I couldn't have my parents um, coddle me, and I just I needed to put on my big boy pants and man up. So yeah, yeah, uh huh. Yeah, so I, I go to this place, and uh, I guarantee you, within two hours of getting there, I'm like, what the hell did I do? <laughs> it's not right for me, you know. Um, because my parents told me before I left, they're like, well, we'll pay for you to go to like, I don't know, one of those resorts that you see on TV. Right. You know, and I was like, no, I need to do this. So, um, but I, I stayed because I talked to a lot of graduates from this place and I stayed and uh, it took me a month till I actually got um, serious and honest. And um, like I said, it always, it starts and ends with honesty with me. It, it always has and it always will. And, uh, like I said before, like I need validation from others, right? Because I feel so insecure. So for years, I had told these stories, whether they be fishing stories or exaggerations or stories that happen to my friends or just flat out made out lies. I would tell these stories about my life. And I told them so often, I honestly believe they happened. So I find myself telling these fabrications to these guys I had never met in my life, you know, on these one on ones that they call them. And uh, like, I was like, if I can't be honest with guys I just met a month ago, how the hell am I going to be honest when I get back out into society? Right. And it really messed with me. Like I tried to like 
slip myself and, and tell on myself and I, and I chickened out, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so I talked with the counselor we stayed up super late and then, and he helped me find the courage to, they call it encountering yourself. So in front of this room of, and there's 50 guys in this treatment center, um, put myself in the middle of the room, I'm sitting on a stool and then I'm shaking and I'm sweating and I have this piece of paper and I go through every single lie I told to a brother there, what really happened and why I told it. And, uh, I got met with mostly a lot of support, but um, from that moment forward, that was a turning point for me because that was like my biggest fear of of just worried about what other people thought and, oh my God, they're not going to like me and yada, yada. And to get met with mostly support and respect and admiration, um, honesty has not been that big of a deal for me ever since. That is not to say I'm honest every day, Omar, because I'm not. <laughs> but instead of telling four to five lies an hour, I tell maybe four to five lies in a day or every two days. You know, <laughs> So I'm not going to toot my horn and say I'm 100% honest all the time because I'm not. But it's hell of a lot better. Way more improved. And, and that then I could quit telling those stories in my first step autobiography that I told in that treatment center. You know, it's like – you gotta be kidding me, dude. This is your chance to get honest and, and start over. And you went to this gnarly place and, and you're, you're putting up with the rules and you're not getting kicked out. And, uh, cause they'll just, they'll just boot you out of the program. Cause most people are there with a nudge from the judge. And, um, and, and that moment was a changing moment in my life, in my recovery. And, um, to while I was still in retreatment, I wasn't in recovery yet, but that was a huge part of my story. And, uh, I worked on myself. I learned more about myself in those four months there than my entire 27 years of my entire existence. So like I said, I learned I was a self-loathing narcissist. I learned I played the victim. I played the victim for a reason. I learned, don't you know who I think I am is a bunch of bullshit. And I lived that and that, um, just, I learned so much stuff. And, and, uh, when I, when I came time for me to leave, um, I, I, uh, I met with my sponsor who agreed to continue to sponsor me. Um, that was a funny, conversation because he came to the treatment center with my case manager and he looks at me and goes marv why don't you tell him how magical your third step was because <laughs> the story with that is i meet him at four in the morning on top of a mountain uh-huh i don't see him there so i get loaded i just pop some pills oh. not knowing that he was seeing me from across the parking lot do this and then go there and pretend to work my third step with him so i thought he didn't know that so then i was like all right the cat's out of the bag like i can't you know, I mean, this guy's been sober longer than I've been alive, so I think he knows what the hell he's doing. You know, how long's your sponsor been sober? He's been sober uh, thirty years, and his his sobriety is like three months older than me. Oh wow! Right, that's incredible. So that um, is incredible. Right. So, uh, and he got sober really young, like younger than me. But like that's what drew me to him. That, and he was entrepreneur very successful and just brutally honest just i mean you can't when he laughs at you that certain way you're like damn it <laughs> son of a you know but uh i love the guy and uh so so i got out and i worked steps i worked all 12 steps and within 12 months of getting out of that treatment center i moved into sober living where i stayed for well over two years um I worked a, a job that taught me a bunch of humility that I was way overqualified for, underpaid for. I wasn't allowed to call in sick. I wasn't allowed to – well, I bitched and complained, but I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but I worked to myself, right? I didn't get a job. I didn't, I didn't get the nice stuff. I just worked to myself for the first time ever. And what do you know? Some magical things happened. Um, I started to get something resembling self-esteem and self-worth. I started being able to recognize the man looking back in the mirror and I started needing less validation from others. I started feeling a little bit more secure about myself and starting to find my own identity. And, uh, it's a result of the 12 steps. I know not everybody in recovery goes to 12 step fellowships for me. If I don't go, I don't do the 12 steps and I'm not in recovery via narcotics anonymous or alcoholics anonymous on a daily basis. I am crazy. I am insane. And I am a threat to myself and society. So I need to do that. Because I suffer from alcoholism, where the ism stands for incredibly short memory. So if I don't do something every day, I'm fucked. <laughs> and, uh, I don't have a fancy euphemism for addiction yet. I'm still trying to create one, but I, that's, I'm not smart enough for that yet. But uh, but that that's just was what I've been given. And um, like my sister wrote me a letter saying she never wanted to talk to me again, and now we have a really good relationship. Um, my uh, my family's proud of me. I'm not the black sheep anymore. You know, I'm not showing up with bags under my eyes or bloody noses or 
or weight fluctuating 50, 60, 70 pounds or, or shady or just doing stupid stuff. We'll just leave it at that. I don't need to go into too much detail, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and it was crazy cause, uh, that voice was, was less and less prevalent in my head. That voice of you're a piece of shit, you're no good, you're less than, you know, you're a fraud, you're a fake. Um, it started to get silenced and, uh, and it's, it's a miracle, you know, the, the obsession to use and the, and the drink was lifted. Um, that was lifted for me in treatment. Um, the first couple of times that was, it was, I was around it. I had panic attacks, which I'm grateful today because the first time when I was around it, when I went to that treatment center at 25, like I was like, I'm fine with this, you know, it's no big deal. But like I had physical responses, you know, and, uh, and I think that was my higher power looking out for me, you know, to, cause I, I have an allergy. Like I am allergic to drugs and alcohol, put anything in my body and who knows when I'm going to stop. I just know I'm going to want more and more and more. One is too many, a thousand is never enough. That sums me up. Anything can release the, the disease of addiction and alcoholism at any point. And, um, my recovery to this day in graduate, well, graduating that treatment program meant more to me than graduating college, which goes to show like how much that saved me yes. and, and getting clean and sober and actually recovering by working the 12 steps has the potential to be the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. And I say potential because at any point I could choose to mess it all up and throw it all away, you know? And at this point with how many relapses I had and how many of the same mistakes I made over and over and over and over again, I could not be mad at the disease. I can only be mad at myself because I know what the hell I have to do. You know, I know what I have to do to keep my spiritual condition fit to where when I, cause we're going to have those weak moments like literature talks about, where we're not going to have that mental defense. But if my spiritual condition is fit enough, I'm not going to have to worry about that. You know, but again, I have to work on this every day. It doesn't matter that I did all 12 steps a year ago. It doesn't matter that I talked to my sponsor yesterday. It doesn't matter that I went to a meeting last night. I need to do this every single day. Um, and, uh, it's just amazing what I've accomplished. Um, but life, I was not given life on a silver platter. I was not given you a million dollars. I was not giving the, given the winning lottery tickets when I got clean. I'm still waiting for that to happen. So Omar, if you know anything about that, let me know. <laughs> I'm waiting too, buddy. You know? Right? I'm still waiting <laughs> for life on a silver platter. I don't know who's ahead in line, you or me. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. <laughs> but you did bring it up, so I might have to split it with you. <laughs> there we go. All right. So everybody here is right now. If one of us wins. We got to split it. <laughs> there you go. I can dig it. <laughs> you all right? Let's see. There's a couple things I could say, and then I'll let you ask me questions, wrap this up. Um, I don't know what a man feels like, but I act like how I mean a man I think should act. Does that make sense? Like to me, I'm still a scared little boy. Um, but, uh, but I know I, I've handled some adult stuff and I've handled it well with my head held high with some dignity. Yes. Let's see. I lost my mom in January. Uh, it's actually going to be the one year anniversary in two weeks of when I lost my mom suddenly and I didn't use over it. I didn't relapse over it. I actually was there for my family. I was able to help them out. And they looked to me as a source of strength. Cause when there was a, a death in the family, when I was in the midst of a relapse, I did some terrible stuff. You were gone. Yeah. And, uh, it was bad. And, and I was there for my family. Um, I, uh, see my girlfriend who I met in that sober living, who's, she has five years sober, who we stayed together even during my relapsing in time and treatment, which I don't know why she stuck with me, but I'm the luckiest man alive. Um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and she's been fighting that for two years. And uh, I didn't use that as it. Well, first of all, back in the day, if somebody I was dating and, and well, not dating, playing was the key word, you know, um, told me they had cancer. My reaction, the only reaction I'd be comfortable saying on this podcast with you and to your listeners is be like, you got the big C. Well, that sucks. I'm out. Good luck with that. Exactly. My other two reactions would not be very good, but we're just going to leave that be. Um, but uh, I didn't do that. I stayed with her, um, was faithful and supportive, and I'm happy to announced that uh she's in remission she's actually getting her we have a uh an appointment to get her port taken out tomorrow morning at 7 a.m so she is fully finished with treatment she just finished a couple weeks ago oh wow that is um that's fantastic right congratulations and, uh, Woo. thank you i know and i there's no way i would be able to handle that you know seeing how my mom was sick you know that that's one of the blessings which i mean it's terrible but like 
you know, people are like, are you, are you re- willing to do what that's going to happen? I was like, I saw what happened to my mom. I learned from my dad. He stuck with her. My mom was sick for 10 years before she passed. And, and this is what I'm willing to do. And, and I went through that and, um, I, uh, I finally had the courage and the self-worth to quit my job, my corporate job in January and, and have started doing this one rep at a time training full time. And I'm doing my website and my blog and writing and, and reaching out to people like yourself and, and trying to get my name out there and, and just help people in the recovery, social media, website sphere. Um, I'm doing that full time now. You know, I finally had the courage and the self-worth and the confidence that I wasn't going to mess it up because in the past I'd be like that farmer at the farmer's market, right? I bring my apple cart to the market. I would shine every apple. I would put it up in a perfect pyramid. Every bruise would be hidden. It would look perfect. I would step back, look at my apple cart, and then kick the damn wheels from underneath it, sending my apples flying. Because I would always self-sabotage because I had no self-esteem. I would never allow myself to have anything worthwhile. I wasn't good enough. I didn't know what I was doing that at the time, but that's what I did. And uh, I now know that self-sabotage is not that other shoe waiting to drop, and it's because of my recovery. So like, I had the courage to start my own business, so I'm fully self-employed. And... Uh, you know, it, it has its growing pains. You know, I've been doing this for less than six months, but I love what I'm doing. And like I said, like you read in the beginning, like I have, I know without a doubt, I found my life purpose. I know without a doubt, I was obsessed with weightlifting, obsessed with nutrition, physical, anything physical exercise, the, 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 the human mindset, the wiring, the anatomy, the physiology, the whatever, you know, I became obsessed with that and went through everything I went through to be in the position I am today to help people, to not let them make the same mistakes I did, to be realistic about what can be accomplished, to be realistic about the tricks of the fitness industry or the supplement industry or whatever. And um, and this is scary for my ego, but I am truly grateful that I am an al- alcoholic addict because I would not be where I am today had I not had those 10 years, that decade long of misery. The only thing I regret is the pain and agony and suffering I caused all my family and friends and loved ones. But that's why I try to make a living amends today and try to live my life on a, on a more spiritual basis. And that's your story. That's my story. Beautiful, man. You know, even even at three and a half years, there's still that what we call the terminal uniqueness. There's certain aspects of our recovery that we feel, or not even our, our recovery, uh, our recovery as well as our using time, right? There's so, so many parallels in other people's lives that we've gone through. That as you go through your story and you think, you know, man, this is a horrible thing, or hey, I don't want to talk about this, or oh man, nobody else could understand me. So many of us have gone through all that. You know, those feelings of inadequacy and insecurity and these ridiculous fantasies that we have in our minds about who we want to be and and what would happen if this came, you know, what difference it would make in our lives. Unable to be grateful for what we have, unable to live in the moment which ultimately leads us to drugs and alcohol. So, so many different parallels with what you were going through that I, that I can relate to, man, um, especially coming into recovery, right? When, you, when you're all dirty and, you, and you've been out using and you come into the meetings and, and you're trying to hold it together and you feel like yeah. everybody's staring at you, like everybody knows. Everybody knows that I'm using, right? And I, that uncomprehensible demoralization that you feel you know, surrounded by your own ego, because that's it. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. I I remember complaining one time to my ex-wife, you know, when we were just separated. And I remember coming back from a meeting all pissed off. You know what this guy said to me? And -and so-and-so made this comment. And who does he think he is? And she looked at me. She goes, isn't this just a room full of other drug addicts trying to get clean? And it was such a huge, like epiphany right that it was like wow these guys are just a bunch of assholes like me right Right? (laughs) it's all these wonderful little aha moments and epiphanies that that go on in our lives there's no question about it man that the relate the relatability to your whole story i can relate to it our listeners are going to be able to relate to it and it's and it's just that frail human condition we all have it but for some of us we can only seek something outside of us to comfort us when when it hits as hard as it does. Oh, without a doubt. Like my favorite phrase for that is we're all the same dog. We just have different tails. Yeah, for sure. You know, and once you get onto this side and the importance of sharing and being part of this fellowship is being able to share your truth as 
as ridiculously insane as we feel it is, and somebody else going, I understand. I understand. Oh, yeah. And I've been there. And yeah. boom, it goes away. It like it goes away. I can't remember the last time I felt uncomfortable for the shit that I've done in my life. And it's a lot of it. You know, like you share about there's things that, you know, are better left unsaid. And it's like, you know, I no longer, you know, I tell stories and sometimes I forget because I'm so removed from it. I, I completely detach myself from that person that I was. So when I share about it, you know, some people will actually ask me, wow, man, it's so cool that you can talk about that and not feel uncomfortable because you know again i'm in my shoes i'm not in theirs and they're going how could you say such a thing right like i would never tell anybody that story you know about the drugs i did or about you know whatever other kind of ridiculous things that 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 i did or or did to my family you know what i mean like those things are are for some people you know very very touchy subjects and today we can talk about these things right because not only do they help us, they help others. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Normally, I don't kind of censor myself. I don't know why I kind of censor myself on this podcast, but I mean, it is what it is. I'll have to look into that. But yeah, like when I, because I do a lot of H&I work at men's facilities and, and I get as brutal honest as I possibly can, you know, be like, look, look, if I'm vulnerable, like there's one of you's got to relate to me. And if not, then I'm just reminding myself of how far I've come. Yeah, no, it, and and listen, it, it, it's irrelevant. You know what I mean? I mean, the, trust me, you know, we went through a, well, you know, you covered a lot in your story, and, and, and enough to you where where you can truly relate to the feelings, right? Because it's it's basically it's all it is. We yeah. have these feelings. We cannot process our feelings properly. So I need to fill this, you know, God shaped hole with something, <laughs> with food, with drugs, with sex, with weightlifting, with vanity, with you know steroids, with whatever, what, whatever I think. I need on the outside to make me feel good on the inside, right? Is something that we can all relate to. And, you know, this is something that, like, as you were talking, I was like, man, I can totally relate to that. Totally relate to being in high school and wanting to be all juiced up and jacked up and ripped, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and be that guy. And I was never that guy, all right? But I always wanted to be that guy. But there was no way I was going to, you know, put in the work. Right. Mm -hmm. Go to the gym, like you say, three hours a day, eat, you know, seven meals a day, you know, boiled chicken and, and, and vegetables. Right. And, and get enough rest, drink lots of water. I wasn't going to do that. Right. And, and I was too, t too afraid to do the steroids. So I guess I'm just going to stay like this. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> it's just about, you know, how much tenacity am I willing to go for? You know, or, you know, how, t yeah. how tenacious I am for this. All right. So anyway, listen, Marv, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us today. And uh, so but we're going to start to close up here and we're going to move into the section for our newcomers. So I'm going to ask you five questions about your early recovery, and I want you to respond with those inspiring answers that you can share with our newcomers. Are you ready? Yes, sir. All right. So first of all, number one, what was keeping you from getting clean or staying clean when you first got introduced to recovery? I was too damn smart for my own good. I was going to figure out how I could learn to drink or use like a gentleman or learn the trick to maintain and uh, I wasn't going to tell somebody my deepest, darkest secrets. I wasn't going to follow a program. I wasn't going to meetings daily. You know, I'm going to figure this shit out on my own. I'm, I'm analytical. I just, I miss something. I miss something. I'm going to come to the meetings, learn how they use successfully or drink successfully, and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Like, I just, you know, events X, Y, and Z happened, so it only got that bad. Had that not happened, I'd have been fine. You know, I just got to learn how to maintain again. And, and I just... You know, I just I thought I could figure it out on my own, and I proved time and time again that that was never going to happen. And I've watched that happen so many times. You know, there's guys that I've sponsored where a lot of times my comment is, "You're too smart for your own good, buddy. You're yep. way too smart for you're trying to figure this thing out, and there's nothing to figure out. This is not something. This has already been figured out for you. You need to follow directions." Like, this is the easier, softer way. Yeah. It is. I was like, fuck that. I ain't doing that shit, man. I'm not writing stuff down. I'm not doing a meditation. I'm not praying. Uh, I heard the word God, and I equated religion to it, yeah. so I ain't doing that. And, uh, and, and man, I could have saved myself years and years of pain and suffering. But, again, had I not done what I did, I wouldn't be where I am today. Absolutely not. 
All right, so number two, uh, you covered this, but let's put this in a nutshell because it's, it's a beautiful story. At what point did you have that spiritual awakening, that aha moment in recovery, when you accepted that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol, but the first time had developed the hope that you could recover? Yeah, it was when I was, I talked about, I was in treatment and I, and I uh, encountered myself for being dishonest and, and walked, that was my biggest fear, right? Because I was just so worried what everybody would think of me. And uh, that night, like something changed, man, like, uh, like a weight was lifted from my shoulders. And uh, I knew if I could get through that and that, cause that was like my biggest fear of just the, sh- you know, the scam is up. They're going to realize I'm um, a fake and a fraud. And I got through that and uh, everything changed from that moment forward. Man, it's amazing. It's so, that ego is so powerful. It talks to you in your own voice and it's constantly just manipulating and justifying and rationalize and isolating you. And until you can just completely let go, that's, that, that's step three. It's so, so unbelievably powerful in early recovery. You've got to turn it over. So yeah, I, I, I totally get it. So number three, do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to a newcomer that you read in early recovery? Well, if you're going to do 12 steps, which I highly recommend, um, which is, well, I should rephrase that. I do 12 step fellowships. So the basic text for Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, specifically for any relapser, chapter seven in the Narcotics Anonymous book about relapse and recovery, that chapter saved my effing life. And, uh, for that Alcoholics Anonymous book, We Agnostics is my favorite chapter, but today I read like Living Clean and whatever, but like you need to, whatever fellowship you're going to choose, you need to read their basic text to understand what it is that you are in essence signing up for or what it is that you're going to do to save your life. Absolutely. You need that foundation and you find it in, of course, the big book and the basic text. That's the first book I read in early recovery was the was the basic text, and I found me all over it. Dude, it's like, how the hell did they write my story yeah. 60 years ago? <laughs> what the that's, hell? That's what I was like, wow, if you can relate to this, what do you mean? If I can't relate to this, oh my right? God, I can't find something in here I can't relate to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so Marv, what is the best suggestion you have ever received? The biggest, well, I would say the biggest, it's a suggestion, but the biggest distinction that really made a difference for me was when I went to that first rehab at 25, the, the intake nurse looked at me cause I was, you know, I was out of the psych ward. Like I hadn't slept in 10 days. I was a mess. She looked at me straight in the eyes and she said, you are not an evil person getting righteous. You are a sick person getting better. Yes. And that made a huge difference to me cause I am really good at assigning morality, whether it would be, I mean, it would be as trivial as what I ate or how many ab veins I had popping out that day. But like, that's just crazy. But I, but I was really good at like, I was evil. I was scum of the earth. I was the devil incarnate. I had turned my back on religion and, and blah, blah, blah. And when she said that, like, I just broke down and melted down. And that was the first softening of my outer shell that I had developed over the years. That was another thing that I could relate to a lot. You know, it's that bravado, you know, this, this bad guy, this, this tough guy, badass exterior that we put off, you know, that we, that we've given to the world. And then, you know, when we're off the drugs faced with all the horrible things we've done, the ass kicking machine just goes into full gear and you just need somebody to give you, you know, like to give you the opportunity to turn it off. Like, give yourself a break, man. You're just, you're not responsible for your addiction. You're only responsible for your recovery. Okay, so Marv, number five, finally, if you could give a newcomer only one suggestion, what would that be? You need to be hard on yourself, but you can't beat yourself up too much. And what I mean by this is give yourself a freaking chance. Um, We've been talking for, what, 80 minutes? And while we've been talking for 80 minutes... A drug addict or alcoholic picked up a drink or a drug for the first time. A drug addict or alcoholic put down a drink or a drug for the last time. And a drug addict or alcoholic died, never once making it to the rooms of a fellowship. So you're given a valuable opportunity and you need to take advantage. And you need to beat yourself up to be able to do the work. But at the same time, again, like I said before, you're not evil. You are sick. There's a big distinction. But... Fucking A, man. This is the easier, softer way. This is the one way that has been proven for the first – like the literature says, for the first time in mankind's history, there's there's proven a way that could overcome and help somebody recover. You're fucking worth it. Quit making these excuses. You're worth it. 
Let's knock it off. You're you're guaranteed. You, yeah, you have everybody has a relapse in us. I have a relapse in me. Omar, you have a relapse in you. But I don't know if I have another recovery in me. I don't know if I'm ever gonna make it back. So I ain't gonna roll the dice. I'm done playing Russian roulette. Give yourself a chance. And we all. I knew what I needed to do. I didn't know like specific. Like I knew the concept of what I needed to do to recover and get clean and get off of drugs and alcohol. It just was I gonna do it. Absolutely. No question about it. One of the things I like to say is, or something I learned in recovery early on too, is be gentle and kind with yourself and love yourself. You have to learn to love yourself. Oh yeah. When I was in treatment, I wrote self-love on my knuckles every day because I hated myself so much. So I would look at that to remind myself. I never got it tattooed, but like for four four months, I had self-love written on my knuckles to try and remind myself that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, if you guys are having a tough time reminding yourself of that, there's a good, there, there's another great suggestion. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So excellent. Marv, thank you so much for joining us, man. Thank you for having me on, man. This is an awesome opportunity. I'm super blessed and I'm super grateful. Same here, brother. Same here. Absolutely. All right, folks. We have now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Thank you for joining us on the Share Recovery Podcast. To check out the show notes page on this interview or to thank our guests for sharing their story, go to www.thesharepodcast.com. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, podcasts, and interviews. Want to be one of our guests and share your story? Then go to our website and click on the Share Your Story button. We share our inspiring recovery stories every Tuesday. So subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to get your free weekly download. We'll see you then. The opinions shared on this show reflect those of the individual speaker and not of any 12-step.